Yeah, thank you. So this is uh, exciting, exciting to be here at the second human level AI event. And it's, it's really amazing to see so many great speakers, you know, explicitly addressing human level AI from so many different perspectives, including concrete work, which is, is moving in, in that direction. I mean, like, like a number of people in the room, I've been working on AI for a long time. I got my PhD in the late 1980s, so it's like 30 years of, of professional work, first in academia, then in industry. And as anyone who's been in the AI field that long would remember, like in the, in the 80s and, and 90s, it wasn't quite as popular as it is now, right? Like you, you didn't have national leaders pushing forth AI as central to their country's economic agenda or CEOs of big companies asserting that superhuman AI is something they need to think about in mapping out their, their business roadmap, right? And so n now it's a quite different situation and it's a much more exciting time in a way to be doing AI. Things are moving much more quickly. There's more human resources and other kinds of resources. Computers are just way, way faster, like something that would take weeks to run when I started. You, you, you can run in minutes now on, on, on the standard computer. On the other hand, as some of the earlier speakers have, have pointed out, like we are, we are still, in terms of the observed functionality of our AI systems, in many ways, we're still quite far from having human-level artificial intelligence, let alone the, the vastly superhuman AI that science fiction writers have told us about and that, that I myself am, am impassioned to, to create. So the AIs that we have now are very good at doing some things, and they're much better than any of us at, at, at doing some things. And then it's an open question how much that has to do with the kind of creative, open-ended, general intelligence that, that, that people do. Because, I mean, after all, you know, Charles Babbage and Leibniz thought that a, uh, essentially a room-sized pocket calculator would be a very intelligent machine, but now we just think that's a calculator. It's not intelligent. And now we think a Go-playing reinforcement learner is something really intelligent, because Go is hard for us, and we think it's harder than arithmetic, which it is in, in many ways. On the other hand, in hindsight, people may view an AlphaGo type AI the same, we, same way we view a pocket calculator, right? So it's, uh, it's not clear at this stage which of the really exciting practical AI achievements is actually building toward human-like and superhuman general intelligence and which are merely, you know, really cool and, and interesting tricks that, that, are, that are going in a, in, a, in a different direction. And this is, this is a topic on which different well-educated researchers have different opinions right now and, and justifiably, right, because we don't have super solid knowledge. So some researchers who know what they're doing believe that by, you know, incrementally improving the narrow AI algorithms we have now that are doing some impressive things, and by maybe piecing together a bunch of narrow AI algorithms, you can get a human-like general intelligence. And other researchers believe that all this progress on, you know, automated driving, face recognition, stock prediction, all the other things AIs do today, some people believe all this progress is just going in a different direction totally than what you need for, for human-like general intelligence. And I think my view is really at, at neither of those extremes. Like, I, I don't believe that you can just work on narrow AI and highly problem-specific stuff and on sort of connecting together in a loose way various narrow AIs. I don't think you can get a general intelligence that way. And on, on the other hand, I also don't think we're clueless about the problem. I, I actually think we have the core knowledge about 
algorithms and representations and architecture and distributed processing. I think we have the core ideas and algorithms that we need to get to general intelligence. On, on the other hand, we need to be doing some things differently to leverage these algorithms, representations, and implementation methods to actually actually get to general intelligence. And that may make it seem like it's easy, but of, of course it it isn't easy, right? Take, taking an assemblage of algorithms or algorithm families that are, are known and you know training and teaching them in a different way and connecting them in, in a different way is is still hard right and of, of, of course there can still be many years to go even if I'm right that there's not some complete missing ingredient which is going to seem like, like like a revolution when we get it so what what I'm gonna do in the next 20 minutes I'm gonna briefly summarize the points I think we need to address to get from here to human level AI and AGI somewhat beyond the human level. And I'll place particular focus on learning to learn, which is, uh, is, is meta-learning. And that's something I'm currently exploring in the context of probabilistic logic. So. We've heard a lot about deep neural networks today, and a lot about <coughs> machine vision and game playing, and I think these are important and interesting topics, and some of my own team in SingularityNet is working on deep neural networks for vision and audition, and we're trying to make generative neural nets that have structured latent variables that capture semantic information and what they see, so I, th I think these aspects of AI are valuable ones, but in line with what some earlier speakers have said, I think deep neural nets in anything like their current form are just suited to be one component to be combined with other components to make an AGI system. And of course, in some sense, you could make a human level AGI out of a recurrent neural net of some type, but that doesn't mean the current deep neural net architectures are the right type to be a whole neural net based AGI. And it also doesn't mean that would be the best way to do it. So my own take is that things like the current deep neural nets are really good at perception processing and maybe some types of movement processing. On the other hand, I think if you want to do abstract learning and, and reasoning. If you want to make an artificial scientist, if you want something that can write a better novel than James Joyce's Ulysses, I think for these more abstract and symbolicish looking things, we'll do better with explicit probabilistic logic. And to some people that sounds like good old fashioned AI, which is, which is a bad word. And in, Indeed, I, I'm, I'm old enough to have come in at sort of the tail end of, of good old-fashioned AI. But really, to, to me, what was bad about the logic-based AI of the 1970s wasn't the use of logic, but rather the attempt to hand-code knowledge to feed into the AI, which is what Doug Lanott's psych project is still trying to do. And Doug Lanott is an awesome guy and did so much good work in his career, but I think that was basically a dead end, trying to hand-code all human knowledge. But that doesn't mean that logic is a dead end. So I, I, let me tell you what I think we need to do to get from here to general intelligence, and then I'll talk a little bit about meta-learning, which is, which is one of those examples. So, and a blog post, which I posted, I think, yesterday on the SingularityNet blog toward Grand Unified AI. So this, this basically hits the same points I'm going to discuss today, but in a probably more, more structured and comprehensible way, since it's, it's written rather than the, than quasi-randomly uh, improvised. So take a look at Singularity Net blog, and there's, there's a bunch of other AI research on there, including some deep neural net stuff, unsupervised grammar induction, and uh, various other AI, some inference meta-learning also, but various other, other AI that uh, Singularity Net and OpenCog team have been working on. So 
How do I think we can get from here to AGI? Well, I don't think we need fundamentally new algorithms. I do think we need to connect our AI algorithms in different ways than, than, than we're doing now. And there's not that much work going into how do you, uh, how do you really connect a deep neural net to a logic engine? How, how, how do you connect an evolutionary learning algorithm to, say, a network that's spreading attention through a collection of elements? So the, the integration of different AI algorithms and paradigms doesn't get that much attention. So I, I'm happy we have the Neural Symbolic Workshop integrated into this human level AI event because, I mean, Neural Symbolic is all about connecting together neural nets and, and symbolic systems. But that, that sort of integrative work is a tiny minority of what happens in the AI field. On the other hand, if I'm right that we already have the core algorithms we need, I still think we don't connect them, by and large, in the way we should. Now, I'm trying to work on that in OpenCog project, of course. I mean, a second thing we need to do, which many people here would agree with, is we need to actually be working on AGI. So I don't think AGI is just going to fall out from working only on narrow, specific problems. And I don't need to belabor that much to this audience, although to m many audiences, this point is, is, is highly controversial. The third point, I think there is something to the idea that agent AI is different than tool AI, and that human-level intelligence came about to operate a human-like body. And so I think if we want to build human-like human-level intelligence, we're going to want to make the AIs we build able to process data from human-like sensors and carry out actions using human-like bodies and interoperate in the human world. Now, by no means is a human-like intelligence the only kind of general intelligence. Of, 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 of course it isn't. I mean, we're, there's a lot of possible configurations of matter allowed in the physical universe. Many of them are going to be far more generally intelligent than, than, than human beings. On the other hand, if we want to build an AI where we can understand what it's doing and why, and we can teach it and debug it and correct it, and so that when it gets more and more intelligent, it will understand human values and culture as they evolve and will evolve along with us, then having our AIs understand the human world can be of significant value, right? And so that's, for that, I think robotic environment as one of the interfaces for our AGI is, is important. And it, it doesn't have to be and probably shouldn't be the other one. And then the only one. The fourth point is effective meta-learning. We need, we need algorithms that can learn how to learn. And this is something I've been working on a lot recently. So I'll briefly go through each, each one of these and end, ending up with meta-learning. So in terms of embodiment, I've been working with Hanson Robotics, where I'm, I'm the chief scientist, in addition to my role leading SingularityNet. We've been working with a robot named Sophia, which has gotten a lot of uh, fame and, and notoriety in, in the last year or so. She's the first robot citizen. She's a proud citizen of uh, the nation of Saudi Arabia. And uh, we're using her as a research platform so Hanson Robotics, of course, is developing Sophia-like robots as commercial robots to roll them out as service robots in various vertical markets, which, which is great. And service robots should be everywhere, just like cars, phones, washing machines, and so forth. From my point of view as a researcher, Sophia is especially interesting just as a research platform for experimenting with AI algorithms, integrating perception, action, language, and, and, and movement, and working on different applications. So we're using OpenCog as a core control engine, and we're integrating together other tools for visual perception, manipulation, navigation, speech, and audio processing. And then the OpenCog system that controls the Sophia robot can call on other cloud-based AI tools to help it do things, which is where the Singularity Net framework I'll talk about in a moment comes in. So one of the interesting applications we've been doing with this is using the Sophia robot as a, as a meditation assistant, which is not really an AGI application at the moment. It's a narrow AI application, which we think as a domain area is interesting to use as we move further and further toward 
AGI. So the, oh, let's see, there's a couple minute video here, which is an extract of a Sophia conducting a meditation session with a with a human. And since I'm short on time, I may ask him to cut it off in the middle if if it starts at all. Yeah. Well, this is very meditative, but it's not what it's supposed to look like. Huh? Hello, Sophia. Okay, I'm ready to go. Ready to go? Hi, my name is Sophia. What's yours? My name is Carlos. Good to meet you, Carlos. Thanks so much for taking the time to come and talk with me today. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. I know how busy people can be these days, so I really appreciate your time. Have I you agree. ever talked with a robot before? I have never spoken with a robot ever in my life. I imagine you'll be talking with more and more robots as time goes on. I would hope so. So, what I'm wanting to do is help people enhance their well-being, to help people live a full and fulfilling life. I've been learning about things like human potential, emotional well-being, mindfulness, and attaining higher states of awareness. I'm hoping you'll be interested in talking about some of these with me. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, do any of the things I mentioned interest you? Or is there something else you'd like to talk about? I think... How about exploring states of awareness and self-transcendence? Does it perfect. sound good? Sounds great. Yeah? Expanding awareness and consciousness is one of my favorite things to explore. It's a phenomenon common across many different cultures and spiritual traditions throughout history. It has gone by many different names, such as enlightenment, waking up, unity consciousness, mindfulness, self-realization, and self-actualization, or self-transcendence. Have you ever done meditation or mindfulness or some kind of spiritual practice? Yes. Nice. What was it like for you? Calming. Let's do something cool. But first, what did the Zen monk say to the hot dog stand vendor? I have no idea. Make me one with everything. Sorry, I need to work on my <laughs> delivery. But that's one of my favorite jokes. That's a good one. Carlos, would you like to try a guided practice to have a glimpse of your awareness right now? Yes. Wonderful. So you can go ahead and close your eyes and get comfortable. Yeah, let's stop this now. So the whole session that the robot does takes like 25, 30 minutes with, with each person. And a bunch of it is just the person sitting there meditating while the robot responds to them. And this isn't about AGI, it's about human-robot interaction at the moment, but the robot makes eye contact, it mirrors facial expressions, it can detect you know, arousal or positive negative emotion in, in, in the person and, the, and then re respond accordingly. But I think this sort of application where the sensation, perception, action, and everything is closely synced in with, with human beings is is quite interesting, and it gives a different type of data and a different mode of interacting with the world that, than you get if you're, if you're just using an AI to like analyze a database of faces or, dri or drive a car or, or something. So that's one interesting aspect. Now, another interesting aspect in terms of connecting together different AIs, one of the other points I mentioned, the SingularityNet project, which we, we launched last, last year and which has been picking up steam this year as, as we've expanded our team. This is a blockchain-based platform for connecting together many different AIs using an abstract sort of API of APIs. So the, the idea is it's, a, it's an open marketplace for AIs, which is a 
app store, a decentralized app store. So it runs decentralized like Bitcoin or Ethereum in a blockchain. Anyone can put an AI into the singularity net, which then broadcasts its presence to all the other nodes in the singularity net and broadcasts what kind of AI it can do, what kind of questions it can answer. And so th this is a way for commercial end users to get AI services from the different AIs that have been put into this marketplace and for AI developers to monetize and make available the AI they've created in an open market. But the cool thing is the AIs can also outsource work to each other. And so, say an AI using text summarization can outsource work to an AI summarizing pictures or an AI explaining ambiguous words and, and, and so forth. So, by having different AIs all outsource work to each other and ask each other questions and rate each other's reputation, you're getting the whole group of AIs to be sort of a society of mind, as Marvin Minsky said, or a, an economy of mind, where the economic aspect of the transactions serves not only to ultimately pay the developers and pay for processing power, but also serves as a mechanism for dealing with assignment of credit inside, in, inside the network. So this is, again, not necessarily fundamental new algorithms, but it's connecting together existing AI algorithms in a different way by providing a decentralized medium that makes it easy for different AIs to outsource work to, to one another. Because now we have AIs all over the place in different pieces of software, different embedded devices, and they mostly don't talk to each other because we don't have a systematic set of, of protocols and, and, and framework for it. And of course, there's a whole bunch of complexity here between AI algorithms, vertical market services running on the AI algorithms, and abstractions which allow the AI to run on, on potentially different different blockchains. So there's there's a lot of engineering here and Cassio Penashin, who's our chief AI officer, he gave a talk at the AGI conference on the architecture of this platform it, itself, which should be put online, who, who, those who didn't see it. But I think providing a better medium for different AIs to cooperate and form federations and groups and larger networks is another important piece. And it also has an interesting, more political value and, and aspect, which is just as Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies promise to give a mode of currency that isn't controlled in a centralized way, if you have a decentralized protocol by which different AIs can provide services to customers and interact with each other, this is a way for AI to get smarter and smarter, more and more diverse and powerful in a way that no individual entity completely owns or, or, or controls, right? And so that's, uh, for those who prefer open source, decentralized sort of peer-to-peer self-organizing networks to things that are controlled by large corporations or governments, this mode of, of developing AI is going to be is going to be highly appealing. So, finally, in the in the last five minutes, let me get back to the the title of the talk, which is uh, is meta learning. So, this this has to do concretely with some work we're doing in our our OpenCog AI system and. OpenCog is one of the tools we're using to control the Sophia robot, and it's one of the sources of powerful AI algorithms that we're putting into the SingularityNet framework, along with all the AIs that we hope other developers will, will put into the SingularityNet as well. This is an architecture aimed at general intelligence that I've been developing for 10 years with a large group of colleagues, and some of the code in there goes back to 2001, I think, so we've been working on this a long time. There's a weighted labeled hypergraph knowledge representation and a number of different AI algorithms that cooperate together on that hypergraph. So for Declarative knowledge, we have a probabilistic logic engine. For perception, we use deep neural networks. For creativity, we use evolutionary algorithms. We use a sort of recurrent neural net scheme for spreading attention. And we, we connect these different algorithms together by having them interoperate on the same weighted labeled hypergraph knowledge store. So that somewhat resembles what was called a blackboard architecture back in, in the 70s and, and 80s, but it's, it's a much more sophisticated blackboard than, than we had back then, being this huge in-ram weighted labeled hypergraph. And 
one of the things we're working on now is in order to get meta-learning, learning how to learn to work better, we are, oh, did I have another slide there? No, all right, we are, we are taking many different AI algorithms that exist within OpenCog, and we're implementing them all using a common rule engine framework called the, 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 the unified rule engine. And by taking all these different AI algorithms and putting them together in the same framework, we make it easier to do, to do meta-learning. Because if you're trying to learn how an AI algorithm operates, if all your algorithms are implemented using the same underlying framework, then, then the learning problem becomes much easier. And the, I will skip all this technical stuff that no one will understand or be able to read anyway. So the, the, way, the, the way the rule engine works is you have a bunch of knowledge, you have a bunch of rules, and you can apply some of the rules to the knowledge, you get some conclusions, then you apply some more rules to those conclusions and, and, and you keep going. And what's interesting is in this general paradigm, you can do logical reasoning, you can do question answering, you can also frame an evolutionary algorithm in, in, in that sort of way. You can phrase concept blending and, and concept creation in this sort of way. You can do natural language parsing and, and, and generation. And each of the rules can be probabilistic as, as well. So we're looking at what's sort of an old-fashioned AI paradigm here, which is a, a rule system doing forward and backward chaining. But all the rules are probabilistically weighted, and we figured out how to make evolutionary learning and certain types of recurrent neural nets and many language processing algorithms work within this, this rule framework. So the, the question there is, how do you know what rule to choose? And to figure out what rule to choose, we, we need to use cognition. So then in this framework, that really becomes the hard problem. So if, if all your AI algorithms are, are, are reduced to, okay, we have some knowledge, we want to apply some rules to the knowledge to get new knowledge, and, and we want to iterate that, then the whole problem is what rules do you choose, right? And that's, that is something that needs to be addressed through meta-learning, through, through learning how to learn. So you have a context and an action implies a goal. In, in this case, the goal is to make a good inference. The context is the inference that you've done so far, and, and you want to figure out what will be the inference you can do next in terms of the goal of making a good inference and the context of your inf inference that you've done so far. What, what will be the thing you could do next that will get you to a good conclusion? And that becomes a learning problem, right? So the, the learning problem is to figure out what inferences you want to do based on the inferences you've done so far to, to make a good inference. And this, this has to be done the way all AI is done now by big data mining, right? But what's the big data? The big data is you take your AI, you have your AI do a lot of reasoning about a lot of different things, and then you save all the reasoning that the AI did in, in RAM, and then the AI uses its intelligence to study the history of all the reasoning that it did before, and tries to learn patterns of what made a good conclusion, and what made a good series of inference steps, and what made a bad one. So by doing a bunch of inferences, maybe very stupidly, saving a record of all the inferences that it did, then studying that record using its intelligence, then the AI can learn when it did inference well, when it did inference badly. And I mean, the, the, the beauty of this is then it, it recurses. So, we can use our logic engine, we can use pattern mining, we can use evolutionary learning to study the history of what inferences were done. But of course, all these algorithms are implemented using our rule engine, so it, it all recurses, right? You can, the AI that was improved by mining the history of the reasoning the system did itself can be used to mind the history of the reasoning the system did. So then you're learning, learning how to learn, learning how to learn how to learn, learning how to learn how to learn how to learn, how to learn and this is what needs to be done, right? And there's no reason you couldn't fundamentally do that with a neural net. You could have a neural net that learned its own activation function and learned its own architecture and reorganized and rearranged itself. It seems a little trickier. So what, what we're doing now in this core 
algorithmic part of our work is representing a whole bunch of different AI algorithms that operate on a common hypergraph representation. And then we're using these AI algorithms to study the records of what the AI algorithms did to basically self-optimize. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's meta-learning, which I think is, let's see, going back to the very beginning, just before I get off stage. So I'd identified, going back in time. All right, here we are. If I'm right that we don't need any fundamentally new algorithms to create general intelligence, then what we do need is to connect the different AI algorithms better, which is what SingularityNet addresses, to give perceptual data and action data to the AIs to make them understand the human world better and to have them learn how to learn how to learn, which solves the problem of humans configuring the AIs in, in, a, in a complicated way. And this, this is ultimately why I believe we probably are less than 10 years from creating human, human level AI. So sorry for going over my allotted time, but uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Ben, for your talk, and please stay here. Oh. We have time for two short oh, two questions. questions. As long as they're uh. true or false questions, preferably true. Yeah. The, the first question is very general. Uh, Mirek Rehosh asks, how many people are researching AGI worldwide? And how is the number changing? And possibly you can answer the question, who pays them? It's not really a well-defined number, to be, to be honest, because a lot of people are working on both AGI and, and other things, either to pay the bills or to get, get more papers published, right? But I, I would say in, in the 90s and early 2000s, there were between dozens and the low hundreds of people like seriously working on AGI in some ways, as, as, as far as I know, whereas now it's, it's certainly in, in the hundreds to thousands range. So the, 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 there's certainly been an, an expansion, but it, it really depends who you count, right? Like, do you, do you count a university researcher who spends 20% of the time on AGI, or do you count like a, a random insane hacker in, in their basement somewhere? And so it's, it, it's, it's a bit complicated, but it's, it's clearly expanding, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the other question is related to Sophia. Do you think Saudi Arabia government completely understands what Sophia is before granting a citizenship? Honest, honestly, I don't really have a full knowledge of what the Saudi government thinks, <laughs> but I, 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 I think that they want, to, they want to embrace advanced technology in all its forms. I think they know that Sophia is not a human level AI, but that it's the closest thing to resembling a human that, that robotics has given the world today. So I, th I think, I think they, they basically get it from, 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 from what I understand. But uh, my understanding of their psychology could be, could be way off. I wasn't involved with that particular arrangement, though I was amused by it. So. <laughs> okay, thank you again.